I'm going to put that on pause. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Our Coast, Our Future, a student town hall on the Orange County oil spill. This event is presented by Orange Coast College's Garrison Honor Center, the Coast Report student newspaper, and Green Coast Day. My name is Dr. Vesta Marcina, and I teach political science here at OCC. Thank you to all of our Patty panelists and the audience for joining us today to discuss this matter that affects us. To get us started, I'm going to turn things over to Dr. Jeremy Shermack, OCC journalism instructor and faculty advisor to our student newspaper, The Coast Report. Thank you, Dr. Marcina, I appreciate it. Good afternoon, everyone. Earlier this month, oil was detected in the waters off our coast here in Orange County. Further investigation led to the discovery of a disaster. Thousands of gallons of oil spilled into our waters, devastating the ecological and economical well-being of our community. In the weeks that have followed and to this day, teams of experts and volunteers continue to clean up the coast. While there is progress, while there is progress, the scars of this oil spill will remain and concerns about the future are weighing heavily on the community, including the students here at Orange Coast College. Today, we want to address these concerns and students will lead that conversation. We are honored to be joined today by an esteemed panel of local leaders and experts. Please welcome along with me, Orange County Supervisor Katrina Foley, Los Angeles Times Pulitzer Award-winning columnist, Michael Hiltzik, Congressional candidate Harley Ruda, and joining the town hall in progress a little bit later this hour, Assemblywoman Kati Petrie Norris. Before we begin, I'd like to say that in an effort to have a balanced and comprehensive discussion, we did invite Amplify Energy, which owns the leaking pipeline. They declined our invitation to participate, citing their ongoing work in the cleanup. We also invited US Congressional Representative Michelle Steele but our request went unanswered. Having said that, let's now turn our focus to those who are here. A little bit about the town hall and what you can expect. Each panelist will be asked some questions by journalists from the Coast Report before we have a Q&A session for the last 20 minutes or so of the hour. To the audience, if you have a question, please feel free to enter it in the Q&A area located on the bottom of the Zoom screen. Simply click that and type in your question and our Q&A moder moderators will try to relay as many questions as possible in the time that we have at the end. If you wish to engage on social media, please use the hashtag oilspilltownhall in your tweets and social media posts. Now let's get started. And to do that, please welcome reporter Marissa Lavazzari from the Coast Report. Marissa. Thank you, Dr. Shermack. I'd like to welcome Second District Supervisor for Orange County, Katrina Foley. Supervisor Foley previously served as the mayor of Costa Mesa and now represents the cities of Huntington Beach, Newport Beach, Seal Beach, Costa Mesa, Cypress, La Palma, Los Alamitos, Stanton, and areas of Rossmore, Buena Park, and Fountain Valley. So welcome, Supervisor. So thank you. thank you, it's great to be here. Of course, so my first question for you is, there's a big concern among college students in preserving the environment. And so what are some practical ways for college students to get involved in conservation efforts to mitigate future environmental disasters right here in Orange County? Thank you for asking that question. So I myself have two college student sons. One of them actually is a student at Orange Coast College. And so I'm very familiar with um, what's happening with college students and uh, it's really something that I've tried to get more students engaged in our local uh, politics and local community organizing in our county um, offices. So what can you do? First of all, I would say start by volunteering. Volunteer to clean up. Go to a beach day cleanup. Help me clean up the back bay. We have regular back bay cleanups. You can't believe how much styrofoam and plastic makes its way into the back bay. And it you could spend hours just cleaning a small little area of plastic and uh, styrofoam. Start with that. Consider if Orange Coast College uh, doesn't already have this, which I think they might. I know the city of Costa Mesa, we passed this uh, uh, rule in Costa Mesa for all public buildings. Consider 
uh, advocating for no styrofoam, no uh, plastics or straws on campus. Um, that's something that really makes a big difference. Also, student internships. You can do student internships for course credit. I often have opportunities in my office. You can take a project that you're interested on, interested in and want to see it happen at the county level. We'll work with you to work up that project. You'll have access to county resources and staffing and maybe even get something that is first of its kind on the agenda. We're working on a climate action plan in my office. We're working on long-term sustainability plans and we'd love to have more student interns. Join a committee, get involved. There's so many ways you can participate and make a difference. In a statement, you mentioned that, quote, the impact on the environment is irreversible. We must identify the cause of the spill and for the greater good of our coastal ecological habitat, end quote. What have, you, what have been the immediate effects on wildlife following the oil spill and what do experts see being prolonged consequences? Thanks, that's, that's a great question. And so one of the um, what, one of the things that happened almost immediately was that our Huntington Beach wetlands in the Talbert Marsh area were just demoed by the oil. It really spread into there quickly and um, all over the ecosystem there, birds. I just got a report today. I got it just in time. Um, to date, 101 animals, mostly birds, have uh, been found dead on arrival due to the oil spill. Um, we've captured 34 and cleaned 26 and 19 birds have been released. There's been eight euthanized. We had two dolphins that were impacted. We're still waiting to hear if they were impacted by oil. So it seems like not a lot. However, think about it in terms of the long-term impacts because all those birds are going to continue to nibble on all of the ecosystem that's there in the marsh and then they fly away and they drop that elsewhere and so it does have long impacts we we won't really know the um, impacts to our fish and our marine life they're doing the testing we should have some results in the next day or two but anytime there's an oil spill it's going to have a long-term impact because you can really never really clean it all up completely it, the ocean is mighty and it just pushes the oil to another area. And at this time it's pushed it south. So what can we do? We can stop offshore oil drilling off the coast of California, Washington and Oregon for starters. But while we do that, we need to have a simultaneous plan to protect the workers, to transition those dirty toxic jobs to clean energy jobs and to use the, the workers that are already there to help decommission. So that's a priority for me, workforce development, transitioning jobs, it's gonna be a priority for me. And I do think that um, reducing our reliance on fossil fuels, moving to electric cars, I just bought a great electric car, having more charging stations in our multifamily neighborhoods, easily accessible. These are things I'll work on. This bill did have the potential to close the beaches for a prolonged period of time. However, the crews were able to shorten that closure. What factors played the biggest role in cleanup efforts in order to reopen many beaches within a week? Yeah, well, we got lucky, I will say, um, because one, the Coast Guard surged for maximum resources. They looked at the spill and they said, okay, the maximum amount of oil that could come out of that pipe is somewhere around 140,000 gallons. So we're going to assume that's how much oil came out of the pipe. And then we're gonna surge resources for that amount of oil. Well, as it turned out, the number was somewhere closer to about 26,000. However, we don't know how long the pipe was leaking. It could have been a slow leak that was causing some oil. So I just talked to my son last night and he was saying how there had been tar on the beach for a couple of weeks prior. And some of his friends had been noticing on their towels, they had tar. Who knows that could have been coming from this slow leak because as we all now know, there was an anchor or some kind of movement of the pipe many, many months ago. And that pipe, was slowly leaking. But to answer your question directly, it was the surge of resources, the quick action once we knew that it was massively leaking, the shutting down of the pipe and um, quickly getting cleanup crews out there, putting in the booms, which are those barriers that prevent the oil from spreading, doing all the uh, scanning of the areas along the coastline, 
a lot of resources spent to clean up the beaches and the coastline quickly. And that's really why we were able to get out of it within about 15 days. Well, thank you for joining us, Supervisor Foley, and we look forward to you participating in the Q&A session. Thank you so much, and thanks for hosting this. Thanks for being involved in your uh, community at Orange Coast College. It's great to see you all participating. Thank you. Dr. Shermack, back to you. Great. Thank you so much, Marissa. Thank you, Supervisor Foley. We understand you do have an obligation, so if you need to check out, it's totally understandable. We do appreciate the time that you gave us um, this afternoon. Um, I would next like next to call is about active transportation. So it's all connected. It's all, <laughs> it's all related. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much. Um, I would next like to introduce uh, Coast Report Sports Editor Chris Babona for our next two panelists. Chris, over to you. Thanks, Dr. Shermack. We'd like to bring back in OCC's very own Dr. Vesna Marcina, who has a PhD in political science and has been a full-time faculty member at OCC since 2002. Doctor, a concept that has been discussed related to the oil industry is regulatory capture. Can you give us a definition to that term, please? Yes, Chris, I can. Regulatory capture refers to a phenomenon in which government regulators start to see the world through the eyes of the industry they are supposed to regulate. Governments create regulatory agencies to create rules and restrictions for the private sector. The purpose of those rules and restrictions is to protect the interests of the public. In the case of regulatory capture, regulators become captured by the industry that they're supposed to regulate. That means that the public's interest is no longer represented by those whose job it is to protect it. Right, thank you for that, Dr. Marcina. I'm gonna use that definition as a springboard to our next panelist who has written extensively on the regulatory side of this issue. So please welcome Los Angeles Times Pulitzer Prize winning columnist, Michael Hiltzik. Mr. Thank Hiltzik, you, Chris. yeah, very, very simply here, why didn't the government properly regulate the pipelines? Well, I would endorse, uh, first of all, what Professor Marcina just said, uh, there is regulatory capture. And as I think she indicated, this is not only a problem in the petroleum industry, and really almost any regulated industry. Um, basically, regulators, uh, as she said, begin to take on the, uh, the coloration of the industries they're regulated. Now, on top of that, we have sort of a, an endemic problem in government regulation, which is that the government never wants to actually devote the resources that are necessary for its own agencies to do all the regulation themselves. So they tend to basically outsource regulatory responsibility to the industries themselves and then uh, talk about how they're going to oversee uh, the self-regulatory activities of these industries. So I think what we've seen in the petroleum industry, and this has been documented by the Government Accountability uh, uh, Office, that uh, essentially uh, petroleum uh, pipeline companies, drilling companies are allowed to uh, write their own regulations and enforce their own regulations to the extent they want to. Uh, basically, the government, uh, the government regulators let them do it. The government regulators maybe will, uh, on a situational basis, come in and take a look at whether they're actually complying with the regulations they've written and imposed on themselves. Uh, but that generally happens only when there's a crisis at hand or an incident at hand that focuses attention on, uh, uh, on an issue. It doesn't happen as a matter of course. And as we've seen in this very case, uh, things just sort of uh, continue on uh, as though nobody really is paying attention until there's a reason to wake up and take a look. And that's what we had in this case. We had clearly a uh, pipeline and a, an exposure uh, of potential damage that had been going on for years, maybe decades. Uh, nobody really paid attention until the oil started washing up, uh, bubbling to the surface and then washing up on shore. Right. In your October 6 column, you state that, and I quote, the solutions to these persistent issues aren't hard to find. They mostly involve leaving oil in the ground, end quote. 
Do you believe that California is in a position economically and logistically to leave oil in the ground? And if not now, when will that be? Well, the logistics of the case are that if you leave the oil in the ground, you don't actually have a logistical issue because you're not moving it. Uh, in terms of whether California can afford to, really what we're talking about is shutting off drilling offshore and certainly, uh, and, and maybe even shutting it off onshore. California is a state that actually has done less than most other oil producing states to exploit the, the, the potential economics of oil extraction. We do not have uh, an oil severance tax like uh, Texas does and Alaska does and, and Louisiana does. So we don't actually get direct revenues from oil being extracted either from our waters offshore or uh, or on land. So I think the, the economic impact of closing down offshore oil production would be limited. I mean, we might lose uh, some jobs on land, uh, uh, pipeline companies, uh, uh, terminal companies, things like that. But, but that's the, the, the risk of greater costs from, from accidents is I think much greater. And I think we have seen that the costs are concentrated on coastal communities uh, and uh, uh, while the, the profits are spread around to private operators. Thank you. Last one for me. What were the immediate ep economic ramifications of the Orange County oil spill? Well, I think it's still unclear and old. Uh, I think Supervisor Foley has sort of alluded to that. Uh, California and the local communities have incurred costs and will continue to incur cleanup costs. It's unclear how much of that is going to be reimbursed either uh, by the private operators or by federal government or, or, or the state government. So we don't really know. I, we certainly know that there was a short-term uh, impact on, on tourism, uh, on uh, beach activities and, and what, what have you. There is certainly going to be an impact in terms of wildlife, uh, uh, there's going to be an impact on our wetlands, even though it may have been moderated by, uh, by a, a fast response. But there are costs and there are gonna to continue to be costs and they're gonna extend uh, probably for years. Thank you so much for your insight, Mr. Hiltzik. We look forward to hearing you more in the Q&A. Thank you again. Now back to you, Dr. Shermack. Awesome. Thank you, Chris. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Hiltzik, for joining us. Um, before our next guest, I do just want to remind the audience um, to enter any questions you might have in the Q&A um, area, which is at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Um, some panelists are answering in there as well, and we'll try to get to as many questions as we can um, in the Q&A session uh, at the end. Now, to introduce our next panelist, I'm going to turn it over to Coast Reports Arts and Culture Editor, Tasman McGill. Taz, take it away. Thank you so much, Dr. Shrimack. So the next speaker is California congressional candidate, Harley Ruda. During his time in Congress from 2019 to 2021, Congressman Ruda was a chair of the subcommittee on environment of the House Committee on Oversight and Reform. Welcome, Congressman Ruda. Thank you, Tasman. So my first question is, offshore drilling is something that is widely opposed by both the Democrats and Republicans. In fact, new offshore drilling is opposed by nearly 72% of Californians, according to the Public Policy Institute of California Statewide Survey. With so many opposed to new offshore drilling, how realistic would it be to halt offshore drilling completely? Well, first, let me thank you for organizing uh, this panel and tackling this important topic. And I do want to do a shout out to Supervisor Foley, who did an absolutely amazing, incredible job of keeping uh, the constituents of Orange County aware of what was happening while working with national media to bring this uh, incredible disaster to the attention of those who need to understand what was going on. So hats off to, to all of you for your effort. And you raise a great question. You know, how can we have so much support for uh, uh, offshore drilling, so to speak, uh, to stop offshore drilling, yet we still see so many politicians unwilling to tackle it. And the reason is, is pretty simple. Follow the money. 
Unfortunately, a lot of our elected officials receive a lot of money in donations to their campaigns from uh, fossil fuel industry participants. And because of that, they don't do what you pointed out. 72% of Californians want to see offshore drilling halted. And in fact, a large percentage also want to start seeing us roll back what has already been done. So we have to make sure our elected leaders are willing to do what's right, not just because it's the right thing to do, but also because uh, they're not in the pockets of those who are pushing for an agenda that's inconsistent with what we want to see in our environment. And that, unfortunately, is the number one reason. And together, we just have to make sure that we elect individuals who are willing to serve the constituents. And uh, for question two, you voted yes uh, to banning new offshore drilling in the Atlantic and Pacific Oceans with the Coastal and Marine Economies Protection Act. Due to the steady decline of oil produced in California, do you think that offshore drilling in our state is necessary? Definitely, we need to stop any additional offshore drilling, but frankly, we need to go further than that. And Supervisor Foley talked about how important it is for us to start making investments in renewables and making that transition from fossil fuels to renewables to allow uh, the, the labor force that's currently engaged in uh, fossil fuels to make the migration to uh, good paying jobs in the renewable industry. Because when you look at the existing infrastructure that's in place, you know, we have roughly 27 uh, uh, rigs in man-made islands off the coast of Southern California. In fact, when you look at West Coast drilling, it's basically all concentrated between Santa Barbara and San Diego. And those 27 uh, rigs and islands have approximately 7,000 wells that tie up to it. And when you look at the piping uh, that is on the seabed that connects all of this back and forth, and you start to recognize that this infrastructure is many decades old, some of it more than 40 years old, including the pipe that just broke uh, from the Ellie uh, platform, we know that we have an outdated uh, infrastructure that's at risk of having even more and more breaks. So we have to start figuring out how do we transition completely, not just stopping additional permitting, but starting to shut down these uh, additional, these existing uh, platforms over time working with the owners of it to provide the incentives to migrate towards renewable energies. And, and in fact, I, I'll throw one more thing out and, and then give it back to you. The best way for us to make a transition to renewables is to actually work with energy companies. There's a statistic out there that for every dollar we've provided under the tax code for incentives for renewables, we've provided $80 for fossil fuels. Just imagine if that had been reversed. Energy companies whose primary goal is to get energy produced in point A to point B would have been focusing on creating renewable energies. They would help lead us away from the reliance on fossil fuels. So using our tax code to get the outcomes we want has to be a part of our toolkit. Perfect. Uh, with that being said, this isn't the first time that Orange County has experienced uh, an oil spill like this. Just 30 years ago in February of 1990, the American Trader oil spill affected much of Orange County's beaches. Um, so what have you learned from these disasters? And then how do we can, like, go forward to prevent uh, history and events like this from happening again? Well, Supervisor Foley hit the nail on the head. The long-term implications, we don't even know what they are yet, including the short-term implications of the economic fallout. Uh, we, we are still assessing what the economic fallout is. We know that many small businesses suffered dramatically. In fact, you know, I live in Laguna Beach. Uh, literally overnight, hotel reservations were canceled across the board uh, for tourists coming to the area. That affected restaurants, that affected small businesses. And let's keep in mind, even though this spill ended up being less than originally uh, forecasted, the damage isn't just the damage that occurred during that time frame. The damage goes on. There are many people around the, the country and the world who travel to Orange County who are not aware that our beaches are being cleaned and that the ocean is, is, is available and accessible now. They still think that the area has been marred by an, an oil spill, which it has, but to a degree perhaps much greater than where we are with our cleanup efforts. 
In addition, the impact on wildlife will continue for quite some time. It will take us a long time to figure out what the impact is. I'd also add to this that one of the problems with relying on offshore uh, uh, fossil fuel is that it adds to the continued burning of CO2, which causes climate change to uh, progress at a faster rate, which means bigger, badder, meaner storms and weather events, which also causes more damage to these very wells in areas such as the Gulf of Mexico, where this last hurricane season caused a, an extensive amount of additional spills and leakages. So if we continue to rely on fossil fuel, the leaks are going to continue and continue at a greater rate. Thank you so much, Congressman Ruda. We know you have to leave us at 315, but we really appreciate you joining us. Dr. Shermack, I'll send it back over to you. Great, thank you so much, Taz and Congressman Ruda. Um, I know that we will have uh, Assemblywoman uh, Kati uh, Petrie Norris joining us. Um, I'm not sure if she's on yet. Um, if I could ask Eric Wilson to take a look and see if she is here yet. Um, while he does that, I, um, I'm wondering if uh, Supervisor Foley, if you have a moment before you go to answer a question from the Q and A. Sure, I've been trying to type answers you, as we've been going along. <laughs> you've been a, you've been a champion. I don't even know if we could keep up, but I think there was a question out there. I'm going to turn it over to. Um, our reporter, J.J. Wahlberg, who has been following the Q&A. J.J., you have a question for Supervisor Foley before she runs off. Thank you, Dr. Shermack. Uh, Supervisor Foley, um, this is a question from uh, Tammy Bui. I think I'm saying that right. Um, who was the most, what party was the most affected by the oil spill? And um, the kind of a follow-up, how long will this problem persist for this group of people? Right. So, it's hard, so you'd have to put it into different categories. So in the business category, likely Amplify Energy was the, not Amplify Energy, I'm sorry, the air show was the most impacted. Amplify Energy is the responsible party. But in likelihood, in the business category, in terms of volume of losses, the air show lost millions of dollars by having to cancel that Sunday. Now, in terms of immediate impact on your life, the small businesses, the lobster fisher people, the, uh, the small businesses that depend on their little boats to go out for whale watching, they had an immediate revenue impact that impacted them and their ability to pay their rent. So that maybe was even more impactful because probably they don't have sufficient reserves or insurance to cover that. Long term, uh, I mean, even surfing schools, I would include in that. There's a surf school in Huntington Beach. They have 100 students for an after-school program. They got completely shut down. Likely, they don't have a lot of savings to cover that. Um, and so long-term, though, in terms of the who is impacted the most, it's our, our, whole, our whole economy along the coast. The uncertainty that this might happen again causes people to make decisions about whether they go to our beaches or whether they participate in conventions in our hotels. Um, so we have to make sure that people know that we're taking care of this so that they know it's safe to come to Orange County coastal beaches. I think actually our beaches are probably the cleanest they've ever been given all the cleanup. Hi, Cotty. Great to see you. <laughs> uh, thank thank you. Cotty. Thank you, Supervisor Foley. I know you have to run. We don't want to keep you past your time. We appreciate you being here with us today. Thank you so much and uh, it's great to have our assemblywoman on. She's a great partner for this district and she's doing a lot of amazing work um, to, to help us um, get through this crisis and to find out answers. So I'm gonna take off. It was great to, have, to talk to you all. Thanks Harley for your contributions. Great to have your knowledge and insight. And I look forward to talking to you all again, maybe sometime in person soon. <laughs> Absolutely, thank you so Bye, much. Supervisor. Bye. At this time to introduce our uh, our next uh, panelist, I'm going to turn it over to Coast Reports Editor-in-Chief, Sarah Gidros, to introduce um, Assemblywoman uh, Petrie Norris. Sarah. Thank you, Dr. Sherma. Now joining us is California Assemblywoman Kati Petrie Norris. Assemblywoman Petrie Norris represents the 75th District, which includes Costa Mesa, as well as portions of Huntington Beach. Uh, welcome, Assemblywoman. 
Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here. And uh, yes, I, I represent the 74th Assembly District, which includes actually all of our impacted uh, Orange County coastal communities of Huntington Beach, Newport Beach, Laguna Beach, as well as the cities of Costa Mesa, Irvine, and Laguna Woods. And it's a pleasure to be able to join you today. Thanks for putting on uh, this town hall. Thank you. Um, and so in your October 7th press release, uh, you and other community members called for the end of offshore drilling off California's coast. Uh, what will be the long-term ram ramifications for Californians if offshore drilling continues? Well, Sarah, as uh, I think you may have heard me say before, in some respects, this spill really was our worst fears come to life. Um, I jumped on as I was listening to Supervisor Foley talk about some of the impacts, but this really does have a devastating impact on our oceans, on our wildlife, also on our local small businesses and on our entire community. And uh, as we work to recover from the, the spill, we've also got to make sure that we learn lessons from this disaster and we ensure another disaster like this doesn't happen on our watch. And uh, the most fundamental lesson from this is really, really simple. Right when there's drilling, there is spilling, and uh, I and, and many other leaders across the, the county, including um, Supervisor Foley and and uh, and uh, Representative Harley Ruda, uh, recognize that the time to it is is long past time to ban offshore drilling along the coast, and um, the reality is that if we do not take action now, the risk gets greater and greater each and every day. This is aging infrastructure. And uh, my fear is that if we don't put an end, not just to new offshore drilling, but if we don't begin to responsibly phase out existing operations, that these kinds of spills are going to get more and more frequent. I think in some respects, this really is um, a canary in a coal mine and um, certainly a urgent call urgent call to action um, for all of us across the community. Thank you, Assemblywoman. And for um, our next question, uh, what actions can college students, like many of the attendees here, do to support current or future legislation fighting to ban offshore drilling in our state? Well, and thank you for, for asking that, because I, I think we know that in order for us to be successful, in order for us to, to move the needle and ensure that this is a turning point and that we actually are able to deliver real and meaningful change, we know it's gonna take all of us. And um, so I'm grateful for everyone joining us today. I'm grateful for your uh, willingness to advocate on this really, really critical issue. Um, number one, in terms of what, what we can do right now is we need to mobilize, and it's not just across California, we need to mobilize across the nation to ensure that at the federal level, the federal level, we permanently ban new oil uh, drilling off of the coast. So California actually took that step many years ago. Uh, we are still waiting for our federal partners to catch up. Uh, Senator Feinstein introduced a piece of legislation, the West Coast Ocean Protection Act. Senator Padilla is a co-author on that, and um, that would make a would would make permanent the uh, President Biden's moratorium on drilling off of the coast. And, and we know how um, fleeting a temporary moratorium could be. Just back in uh, 2017, 2018, under the Trump presidency, he was pushing to expand offshore drilling off the coast. So that to me really is step one. We need to permanently ban new drilling. And that is something that we can all mobilize around right now. Um, and then as we move forward, we'll need your help to support legislation here in the state. And then hopefully at the federal level to begin to end existing operations as well and begin to phase out uh, existing operations so that we don't have these, these rigs posing such a um, real and present danger to, um, to our coast and our coastal economy. Thank you so much for that answer. And my final question is that, um, what observations did you have the opportunity to witness when flying over the oil spill on October 4th? So I, uh, I had the opportunity 
yeah, it was, it was Monday, it was October 4th. I went up on a, a flight with the Coast Guard to uh, survey both the damage and survey the early phases of the response operation. And at that point, um, the, the spill actually wasn't what I expected. I expected kind of a, you know, something like a lake and it was instead kind of these little rivers. And I've now actually seen kind of aerial photos, like infrared photos that really show it's kind of these like, you know, sort of rivers just kind of started, you could see it spreading out all along the coastline. And it was those rivers that eventually impacted our beaches from Huntington in the north to our San Diego County beaches in the south. And it was, it felt this sense almost of futility because you could see what was about to happen and know that despite the fact that we had mobilized this incredible response, this unified command, we'd brought kind of the might and power of all of our federal agencies. And there were boats out there that were laying boom and skimming. Once the spill had happened, the damage was done. And I, I think for me, it just really, I think seeing just our beautiful, I mean, it, our beautiful coast from the air, it always takes my breath away. Even when I'm flying into John Wayne, I have that moment or just takes my breath away. It is so beautiful. And I feel so, so blessed to call this piece of paradise my home. And I think surveying that from the sky and seeing kind of these little rivers of damage making their way to the coast, for me just really did bring home the fact that we're stewards. We're stewards of this ocean and we're stewards of this planet. And it's on us to ensure that we take the steps necessary to, uh, to protect our beautiful home. Um, thank you, Assemblywoman Patri Norris. We really appreciate your time and your insights. Uh, Dr. Shermack, uh, back over to you. Great. Thank you, Sarah. And thank you, Assemblywoman Petri Norris. We appreciate it. At this time, we would like to begin the question and answer session um, for all our panelists. Throughout the session, Sarah and also our, our news editor, JJ Wahlberg, have been monitoring the Q&A. We'll now ask questions of the panel with the time we have remaining. Uh, JJ, I'll turn it over to you to ask the first question. Thank you, Dr. Shermack. Um, my first question is going to be for um, Congressman uh, Ruda, and this is coming from uh, Angelica Garcia, um, and she says that federal pipeline safety regulators have stated that there was an indication of a problem um, more than three hours after uh, an alarm. Um, but Amplify Energy said the line had been shut down by 6 a.m. Um, what are the potential charges of the oil company Amplify Energy if there is evidence that the company had not notified immediately at the time of the spill? I think uh, you're, you're, still, <laughs> you're still on mute, Chris. Thank you. Uh, great question, and it's incredibly important that we get to the answer of who knew what and when did they know it. And uh, Assemblywoman Petrie Norris, uh, fortunately, is heading up her subcommittee uh, for uh, the state government and doing a, a, an investigation into what happened. And I'll let her talk more about what she's doing in that area, but it's a really important uh, uh, item that we have to do to find out what who is liable and what can they be charged with and what can we hold them accountable for. But it also, uh, yeah, I would just emphasize, uh, this could have been a lot worse. And I, I went out to the platform. I saw uh, also the, the beginnings of, of where it all started. And uh, Assemblywoman uh, Cotty Petrie Norris talked about flying over it. And it is just absolutely heartbreaking to see it. But what we saw was more or less a trailer of what could be a, a full movie. And that's what we need to avoid. Uh, this, this could have been so much worse. And it's going to be worse if we don't take action. We have to take action. That's why these two pieces of legislation at the federal level are so important. The bipartisan uh, infrastructure package coupled with the Build Back Better uh, plan that we're, we're getting close to having agreement within the Democratic Party have to be passed because that helps provide the resources that moves us from fossil fuels to renewables so we don't have to rely on dirty fuels and, 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 and worry about uh, more of these situations occurring on our beautiful coastline. 
And um, and I'm happy to to jump in on that uh, as well, and, and just share a little bit about the the work we're doing um, as part of of uh, my select committee, or not my the, the assembly's select committee on the Orange County oil spill, which I am going to be chairing. As uh, as, as Congressman Ruta said, there are a lot of unanswered questions about this disaster. Uh, including why was the leak not de detected more quickly? Why was the leak not reported more quickly? Um, I've got a lot of questions just even about the, the response protocols and whether there's an opportunity for us to do a better job with better technology, better equipment. Um, in terms of the investigations that are underway, there are a number of different investigations that are underway at, at the state level, uh, the Department of Justice has launched an investigation into into the spill um, and uh, both civil as well as criminal charges are possible at the federal level uh, the marine the coast guards marine casualty investigators are uh, leading the investigation uh, for the coast guard and um, there's additional investigations underway by a department called uh, PIMSA and um, the uh, state's Department of Fish and Wildlife will be working really closely with our federal partners on, on those investigations. In terms of, I think, the specific question that, uh, that you were asking in terms of what could amplify the responsible for, what's been made really clear to me is that we are looking not just at the potential of civil penalties, so not just at the potential of fines being assessed, there is a potential that criminal charges could be brought. And um, that's actually one reason that uh, some of the investigators have been somewhat tight-lipped in the information that they're sharing with the public. They are building a very meticulous case that could actually take months and years uh, to bring to conclusion that could involve, as I said, not just fines, but criminal penalties as well. And that's what we saw with the uh, refugio oil spill that occurred in 2015. Those investigations actually just came to a close this summer in 2021. And um, just in terms of a, a little bit on, on our select committee, kind of the way that I'm, I, I'm describing our select committee on the Orange County oil spill, a lot of these investigators and uh, the state and federal agencies, they're going to be really focused on what laws were broken. And uh, the work of our uh, select committee as I see it is what laws need to be changed? Where do our regulations, our inspection protocols, our response protocols need to be changed and need to be updated uh, to reflect the lessons from this disaster? If I could add one thing before I have to drop off, and I think uh, Michael and, and Vesna also talked about this. Uh, uh, Condi was just talking about the inspection process. I mentioned earlier, there's thousands of miles of pipeline on our seabed that's supposed to be inspected once a year. Who's inspecting it? How's it being inspected? And is it really being inspected every inch of those pipelines to make sure that there's no leakage, no seepage, uh, that they are infrastructurally sound? And uh, I'm, I'm hopeful that we're going to get better answers to those questions so we can understand just how clear this danger is of additional spills as this aging infrastructure continues to deteriorate. Thank you guys very much. It's been great. Thanks for the invitation. Thank you, Con Congressman Arruda. We really appreciate your time. Thanks so much. I'll turn it back Thanks. to uh, Sarah for our next uh, Q&A question. Sarah. All right. Thank you, Dr. Shermack. And our um, next question is for Mr. Hiltzuk. Um, It's from Lorraine Prinsky. And it's, I've read that the oil companies working in Orange County might file for bankruptcy in order to avoid paying for cleanup or shutting down oil operations off of Southern California coast. Do you think that this is a possibility and how this could be addressed, if so? Is that for me? Just... Yes, sir. Um, uh, sorry. Um, well, it's always a possibility. It's certainly not unusual to see a, a company that, that is in trouble um, trying to discharge its responsibilities by filing for bankruptcy. And I, and I think the possibility that this company would do that sort of points to a, a larger problem in the petroleum industry, which is that the, the half dozen really rich companies have shed their riskiest assets for this very reason. Um, this uh, platform and pipeline was under the control, I think, of 
Exxon Mobil and Shell uh, or, or Chevron uh, not very long ago, they sold off their interests and now they can't be reached um, if in fact there's uh, compensation to be, to be gained. Instead, it's in the hands of a company that, uh, that has not made money that is really on the edge of insolvency, even in the best of times. So it's vulnerable, or we're all vulnerable to its filing for protection under the bankruptcy laws. And I think its responsibilities would be discharged by the bankruptcy court if it did that. So uh, uh, th this is a problem that's been building for some time. I think we need some sort of system that, uh, that ensures that companies that were in control of a petroleum asset when it was built retain responsibility to some degree uh, when that, uh, that asset becomes superannuated and certainly at the point that it's abandoned uh, and this becomes a public charge. Thank you. And we have another question from an audience member, Eric Lynn. And Eric asked, can shutting down drilling or limiting it pose any problems to blue collar workers? Um, or is there enough renewable energy currently to be uh, sustainable? Well, uh, renewable, the renewable energy industry is growing all the time and its potential for job growth is, is tremendous. And I think there have certainly been studies that say that the potential for new jobs in renewable energy and green energy is greater than the potential uh, to lose jobs in petroleum. And I think that's true uh, geographically. I think we would see more jobs here in California than we're already devoting to petroleum here in California. So look, there are going to be dislocations uh, inevitably, no matter what happens in the near term, as we make the necessary transition from fossil fuels to renewable fuels. But there's, uh, there, there's great economic potential in the new industries that are coming online uh, that we should not overlook. And I would just, I would add, because I think it's such a critically important question. Um, so a, a couple of points and, and others may have made this point before I jumped on the call. Um, when you look at the amount of oil that is being produced on these offshore platforms, it's only a third of a percent of California's overall oil production. Um, I think there's, uh, as I've been, been talking to the uh, labor unions and, and other folks, I think there's something like 300 jobs on these platforms. Uh, so we are not, when we're talking about shutting off offshore production, talking about shutting off a significant part of California's overall production. Um, and when you look at the economic impact of that one third of 1% of California's oil production compared to the economic impact of shutting down our coastal economy for a matter of weeks or you know, potentially even months, it's infinitesimally small. Um, but I wanna make sure that, that we really, we don't just go, okay, we're gonna shut it off and you know, trust that people will find good new jobs. We've gotta be really, really mindful as we actually build a just transition and the good news is that the first part of shutting down this offshore production, the uh, work of, of capping these wells and um, the work of decommissioning these rigs, it's the folks that actually already work in the oil and gas industry that would be put to work on those projects and taking kind of that first step to building our clean energy future. And so I think that's really important. And, and we've got to ensure that as we then uh, transition from fossil fuels to California's clean energy economy, that we really and truly are building good, high paying quality jobs that people can, can build a career around. So that's the only way we're going to be able to bring all of California along with us on this, uh, on this journey. Well, thank you, Assemblywoman. And actually this kind of speaks to the next question that I was going to ask you, which is um, when, preventing a spill like this from happening again. You know, it's very clear that maybe we don't want to put so much emphasis on offshore drilling. So how much of our, our new focus should be on emphasizing land-based drilling and how much of it should be on moving the state and the country away from oil altogether? Uh, so 
certainly as we look about uh, look at the goal of transitioning California to a clean energy economy, we are right now working towards a path where California is fully green and transitioned by 2045. And so that's over a course of the next 20, what is that, you know, 24 years and a 24 year plan to do that. That's an ambitious goal. It's one of the most ambitious targets in the world. Um, I do think we can, can absolutely get there. Um, and I think we can do that in a way that ensures that we then don't become reliant on oil production from other, from other countries. So I think that it's important for us to build a plan that is ambitious and a plan that's also responsible. Because the reality is, if we were tomorrow to stop producing oil in California, stop producing oil in America, we would still be importing it from other countries, which, which don't actually, which have much lower environmental standards and much lower standards around uh, you know, many other issues that, that matter to us. So um, I, I think that our current goal and our current plan is both ambitious and if we all actually marshal our resources behind it, achievable. Well, I'm going to jump in. Um, we're just about at time. We wanted to keep this. I know this conversation could go and it should go um, much longer, but we want to be respectful of everyone's time um, that they've given us today. Uh, thank you, uh, JJ and Sarah, um, for uh, navigating the, the Q&A there so wonderfully. We appreciate it. Um, I want to thank everyone who participated today. Um, Michael Hiltzik from the Los Angeles Times, Assemblywoman uh, Petrie Norris, uh, as well as Supervisor Foley, and Congressman Ruta. Um, this has been a wonderful conversation uh, that we again hope will continue on. Um, going forward, please visit coastreportonline.com. That's coastreportonline.com and follow our social media uh, uh, channels for further coverage of today's event and the ongoing story on the oil spill. Today's town hall will be available on Coast Report's YouTube channel in the coming days, and this will also be an audio podcast available in the coming days as well. I will now hand it off to Dr. Marcina for some closing remarks. Thank you, Dr. Shermap. We would also like to thank Lee Gordon from the Garrison Honor Center and John Fawcett from the Business Computer Center. They made this day possible for us. Every year they put on the Green Coast Day in April. So please be sure to attend that in a few months to continue these important conversations. We would also like to thank Dr. John Taylor, Dean of the OCC Library and Learning Support Division, and Eric Wilson of OCC's Instructional Innovation Center. They provided us with the resources necessary to make the town hall possible. Thank you, everybody, for attending, and I hope you have a wonderful day. Thank you so much, everyone. Take care. Thank you all.